Hello and welcome to my first tutorial of C++. In this video I'll explain how to get an IDE, which is a program you use to write programs in, and write your first C++ program. I will be using code blocks for these tutorials because I might have to make some videos at a later date on my laptop, which runs Linux, and code blocks is cross-platform. If, however, you are using Windows, then feel free to get Visual Studio Community Edition. I'll briefly show you how to create a project in that too. Both can be found easily on the web. Search Visual Studio Community for Visual Studio and CodeBlocks for CodeBlocks. This is the site that which you download Visual Studio, and this is the site that you download CodeBlocks. Important note, if you get CodeBlocks, when on the downloads page, make sure that you select the installer with MinGW in the title. This is the compiler you will be using. So to create your first program, Open up your chosen IDE. First, I will show you how to make a project in Visual Studio Community Edition. So you should have a page that looks similar to this. If you click New Project, and either look in the Visual C++ section for an empty project, or type in here, empty project, and hit Enter, you should find an empty C++ project. If you cannot find this, it means that when you've installed Visual Studio, you probably haven't installed the C++ section of it. I would recommend rerunning your installer and checking the uh, additional install options. So, give your project a name. So for example, this would be first, and put it in a location. So I'll just say it's stuck there, then click OK. You'll be greeted with a empty project. Right click on source files and add a new item being a CPP file and call it main. That's usually the entry point to most programs. Click add and you'll be greeted with a blank file. Moving on to code blocks. So you should be greeted with something that looks like this. So to create our first project, click file, new, project, click empty project. It will open up a window that just tells you that you're going to be creating a new project. Click Next, give your project a title, so we will call it First again, and put it in a location. I'm just going to put it where it is. Hit Next. Uh, make sure that the compiler has, se has selected the GNUGCC compiler, and make sure that both of these are ticked, create debug configuration and create release configuration. Click finish and you will be greeted with an empty project. So click on this new file button here and add an empty file. It will ask if you want to add this file into the active project. It has to be saved first. Click yes and call it uh, call it main.cpp. Then it will open a, another window to ask you if you want to add it to the debug and release configurations. Select both of them and click OK. Right, first things first, including. To include something is to gain access to functions and classes that do not exist in this file. We will be including IOStream. It will allow basic input and output to a window. So to include something, we will type hash include. We will do a less than sign and type IO stream. And then close it with a greater than sign. I will go through the syntax in more depth in a later video. Moving on to functions. Functions are sections of code that will do a specific task for you. Functions have four main parts to them. The return type, the identifier, the parameter list, and the body. Firstly, the return type. This is the data that this function will return. A function can return anything you want it to, classes, variables, containers, etc. We will go over all of these shortly. You can also return nothing, 
This is a return type of void. Next is the identifier. This is the name of the function and what you will type to use this function. Next is the parameter list. This is where you can specify what the function needs to be given when used. Similar to the return type, you can pass various objects in this manner. We will cover these at a later date as well. Finally, the body. This is where the code for your function is written. Let's move on and write our first function. This function will have a return type of an integer. Its identifier will be main, and it will have empty brackets signifying that it takes no parameters. This opening brace tells the compiler that we are starting the body of this function now. First things first for any programmer is to print out hello world to a console window. To do this, we need to know a little bit more about C++. In C++, you have access to something called the standard library. The standard library is a collection of functions and objects that we can use in our programming. To access this, we will need to type std colon colon. This will access the standard library's namespace. I will go over namespaces shortly. We need to use the cout class to write characters to the window. This should look something like this. Next, we will tell it what we will be writing out. For this, we use less than, less than, and then in speech marks, type hello world. The code less than, less than is pretty hard for a newcomer to code to understand. For now, let's simply say that we are giving the hello world text to our output. Next is less than, less than, std, colon, colon, endl. endl is telling the output that we are the end of our line. And finally, a semicolon. A semicolon tells the compiler that this is the end of this current operation and any text succeeding it will be in the next operation. After this, we will write std colon colon cin dot get open close brackets. That was quite a mouthful. std colon colon cin dot get open close brackets. Once again, we are accessing the standard library's namespace to get access to cin. If cout is sending characters to our console window, then cin is getting characters from it, i.e. what the user has typed. The dot get code is calling the get function from cn. We can skip this part for now until we have a look at functions. What this code will do is wait for the user to press enter, then it will continue. Finally, a semicolon again to signify the end of this operation. Next, if you remember, this function that we are currently writing has an int return type, an int being an integer, a number, meaning that this function must return a number. When it comes to programming, it's good to remember that when you make a function that may or may not succeed, it's best to return an integer, with zero being a pass. This may seem a little odd, but try to think of it this way. This function may have one, two, four, even a hundred different ways that this function may fail. But generally, it will only have one way that it will succeed. So we will return zero. This function succeeded, so we will return zero. And once again, another semicolon to say that it is the end of the operation. Finally, we have our close brace to tell the compiler that this is the end of our function. Now we will try and compile our program and run it. In code blocks, you can press this button right here to build. It will give you an output here saying if it has built or not. After you've compiled the program, you can press the run button to see what we've created. As you can see, it's opened a window that says hello world and waits for the user to press enter. When we press enter, the program says it's ended. We press any key again to get back to code blocks. I'm going to now copy this code into Visual Studio just to show you how to compile and run code in that. So I'm going to paste the code in here. Now with Visual Studio, you can see there's this local Windows debugger. If you click that, it will compile it and run the program displaying exactly the same and waiting for a user to press enter. You'll notice in Visual Studio that the program just exited straight away, whereas in code blocks it said how long it took to execute the program. That's just a difference between compilers.
Our next topic is data types. When it comes to basic data types, i.e. numbers, booleans or flags, true and false, and characters, there are the following. An int. It's a standard number. A short. It is a small number. A long, which is a large number. A float, which is a number with a decimal place. A double, which is a larger number with a decimal place. We have our boolean, or bool, which is our true or false. And our char, which is a character, so a, b, c, one, two, three. It's important to note that these aren't all of the data types or classes, these are just some of the basics. To define a data type or variable is very simple. All we do is say which one we're using, int for example, give it an identifier and name, so example, for example, and then a semicolon to say that we are at the end of our operation. You can assign your variable zero, for example, or any number you want, it doesn't matter, or you can do that on the next line example equals 8. Okay, next let's write another function. This function will have a void return type, void, meaning that it will not return anything. It will be called print string and it will take a const char star or pointer and this will be called str to print. A const char pointer or a const char star is a rather complex term. For now, just think of it as a collection of chars or characters. We'll then open our scope. And what we're going to do here is we're going to take the code that we had earlier that prints out to the window, copy it, paste it into print string. We are then going to edit it to remove the hello world and to print out the str to print. This function will print out whatever we pass it now. So to change our code in our main function to use it, we simply type print string, open our brackets, open a speech marks signifying that we are going to create our strut to print that this fu function requires and we're going to type hello world. We will end this line with a semicolon to say that we are ending this operation. We will now compile and run the code and you'll see that exactly the same output has happened. If we were to change this world to something else, uh, for example, for example, and then run the code, you'll see that it now prints out that. So as you can see, this code works, but const char pointers are not the easiest or the best data types to work with most of the time. So let's change that to using a string. An std string is a class in the standard namespace that is similar to const char pointer however with a lot more functionality. To do this we will change our const char pointer to std colon colon string. Since strings are objects instead of just raw data, trying to log this out will give us some unexpected results. Feel free to try it. To get the expected results we need to convert that string into a const char pointer. Thankfully, strings have a function called cstr that does just this. To do this, after str to print, type dot c underscore str with an open and close brackets. The way that you would call this function is the same. However, it has a lot more untapped functionality now. A side note, what we have just done has indeed got a lot more functionality, but at the same time, it is a lot more inefficient. In a later lesson, I will go over with you why that is and how we can make it more efficient. Just to check that this works, we will compile it and run it. As you can see, it prints out the same text. The last topic that I want to talk about is namespaces. 
Namespaces are a way to group code together to alleviate issues with multiple definitions with similar names. For example, we know that std namespace has the class string in it. Now imagine that you are trying to use or write some code that has its own version of string in it. When you would type string, which one would the compiler think that you are using? If one string is included in one namespace and the other in the other namespace, then by typing std string, or std colon colon string, should I say, it would know which one you are referring to. You can, however, if you don't want to do this, type using namespace std. This will mean that you will not have to type std colon colon before all of the uses from anything within the std namespace. Whereas this is okay for a new coder, this is not a very good coding practice because of the multiple name definitions that I uh, talked about earlier. So I'd re not recommend doing it, but if you're getting confused with having to type std colon colon all the time, then feel free to do so. Well, that about wraps it up for this lesson. The next lesson we'll look into classes and make a little bit more of a involved program.